Dennis, you will be talking about the Grenfell Tower fire. So, please, Dennis, do you see if we found the device? Did you find the device? Yeah, it's there, Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, President. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk uh, briefly, and it is briefly, about the Grenville uh, Tower fire. Uh, my background is that I was a, a firefighter, a fire chief, a fire inspector in the UK um, for many years, over 40 years, uh, and have been working with CTIF, in fact, uh, established the uh, CTIF Europe Commission nearly 20 years ago, uh, working with the European Commission, which is quite interesting when you think where the UK's position is with Europe <laughs> right in this month. Uh, but I'm not going to say anything about that. I'm just pleased we've, uh, we've got to the semi-final of the World Cup with uh, rugby. <laughs> That's my highlight for today. But this is a serious issue and I want to talk about uh, Grenville in, in sort of 10 areas. It's, it's a fire as you know, that uh, happened quite some time ago now, um, the 14th of June 2017. 72 people died. Um, it was a warm evening when the fire happened. It was Ramadan. Quite a few of the occupants of this building were Muslim, so they were still awake. Uh, it happened 10 minutes to 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, and it effectively, 72 people died, including uh, a stillborn child, born of one of the people who escaped, a lady who escaped. 70 people were injured, and there was something like 223 uh, people who escaped the actual fire itself. Um, it's been the subject, and is the subject, of a very extensive inquiry. The, the UK, as in many of your countries, has a very formal system for dealing with these sorts of national uh, tragedies. Uh, this inquiry commenced in 2017, in September. Uh, it's in two phases. The first phase has just concluded, well it concluded last year, and a report is very imminent, the end of this month uh, will be published. And that looked, the first phase looked at the narrative as we would call it, the events of the night itself. And a lot of the people who gave evidence, and this is a formal court, a lot of the people who gave evidence were firefighters, as well as the people who were actually in the building themselves. Um, alongside this official inquiry is a police inquiry by the Metropolitan Police Service, which is the London Police, and they're already looking at charges of what we refer to as corporate manslaughter. And corporate manslaughter is where the very highest level in an organisation political or service chief can be charged of making errors that have resulted in deaths. The building itself was a very strong uh, concrete construction built in 1972. Uh, 120 flats, one and two bedroom uh, apartments. Uh, it was built very strong because a few years before, well in fact uh, a decade before, we'd had a, a block of flats where a section collapsed after a small gas explosion. So that structurally they made this building particularly strong. I think many of you will now know as well that the, the fire itself lasted for the best part of 60 hours. And one of the biggest debates um, was the external cladding, the envelope of the building aluminium composite material, um, which I think all around the world now people have become uh, aware of. And interesting comparisons have been drawn between the UK use of this material and places like North America or Australia, where it was used but banned over certain heights. Um, so quite a lot of information has emerged from that. The other thing I think that's worth uh, just reflecting on is this started as a fridge for freezer fire in one flat uh, on the uh, on the fourth floor of the building and just managed to penetrate the window of that building. The reason for the spread, and I think again this has been very well documented, but just to touch on it as an overview, three millimeters of aluminium uh, cladding material holding a polyethylene core 
And that ethylene core then had a 50 millimeter gap, a short gap, before it was spaced up to the building, which in turn had a 150 millimeter foam insulation. And that foam insulation was a PIR foam, a polyisocyanate. And that in turn was then attached to the concrete structure, double glazed windows, um, and the cladding system in some parts was wrongly fitted in terms of the fire barriers designed to stop it moving through. But of one particular <coughs> architectural feature was the uh, vertical pyramid columns, which were in fact like a stack and allowed the fire to rapidly move up the face of the building. It had been renovated uh, in a few years, one year before 2016, um, and that was primarily the reason this cladding was put on was primarily for energy efficiency. This was an old concrete building. It suffered from damp, cold, heating loss, so it was insulated with this cladding system. It's not unique, there are many of them. Um, in fact, uh, there's 435 of them, as you can see in this little list, identified across the UK. And some of those buildings are not just simply residential accommodation, although they're students, some of them may be in healthcare. So there's a, there's a real concern of where these buildings are. And the government, our government, has spent and given a 400 million pounds to allow this cladding to be removed, to be taken away and removed. And in the interim, in many of these buildings, there are special procedures, wakeful watches, patrols, there's been alarm systems fitted and so on as an added precaution until uh, these things are done. So, that's the situation. The fire occurs. And I now want to run briefly through the sort of circumstances as this session is about learning the lessons. Um, first of all, there was a lot of falling debris. Um, that falling debris posed a risk, and I don't know if you can make out in the slide but police riot shields are being held above the firefighters to enable them to get in and out of the building. Four casualties were subsequently identified as having injuries consistent with having jumped. So you've also got the added danger of people jumping. Gases were released from the material and some of those gases were naturally carcinogenic, flammable, toxic, and there were risks subsequently identified and health checks are still going on in terms of asbestosis, cancers, asthmas. And Public Health England has actually launched a programme about ground contamination. Internally, this fire, as I say, occurred in one flat on one floor. Um, 120 fire doors were designed to prevent the fire spreading from each of those compartments, which is supposed to have a one hour fire resistance. When they examined the doors, the police afterwards, of the doors that they examined, and 106 of them, by the way, had just been replaced prior to the fire, all of the doors, all of the doors were found to be non-compliant. They did not do the job intended as a fire door. In addition, the refurbishment of that external envelope had also involved some internal works which had restricted staircase widths and corridor widths. So there was actually things going on including for example exposed gas mains within the structure itself. So the fire occurs in the fourth floor flat. Uh, the fire and rescue service London Fire Brigade attend initially with uh, two pumping appliances, two emergency appliances. Um, and they're in attendance within six minutes. So there's no delay in response, they're there straight away. Um, they can see the glow at the window and the officer in charge makes up to four pumps. So immediately he calls for assistance um, and off they uh, make that uh, attendance and they also send one aerial appliance. The attendance was just normal pumping appliances so an aerial ladder is now ordered on as well. Um, they set up a bridgehead on the second floor, two floors below, which is a common tactic, charge the riser, um, and they notice that, the, as I say, that the fire has breached the window. Eventually, something like 250 firefighters are in attendance with 70 pumps, 
100 ambulance personnel with 200 amb 20 ambulances. And they find, for example, uh, that the firefighting lifts do not work. So moving equipment becomes uh, a logistical problem. They progressively increase the attendance. So at 19 minutes past one, they're at eight pumps. 24 minutes past one, they're at 10 pumps. And then they move to 25 pumps. Uh, they declare a major incident at two o'clock, so just over an hour afterwards, and they move straight up to 40 pumping appliances. So this is a very high level attendance and they obviously can see that things are, are moving rapidly and out of control. The firefighters uh, by then are trying to move through the building, but they've got problems of poor communications. The command unit, which is outside, um, in effect, is taking messages on pieces of paper that are being sent from the brigade control room to the command unit on the ground, by paper, up to the bridgehead, and at the bridgehead, the officer in charge is then giving instructions to each of his firefighting crews to go, go to floor 12, two persons, flat six, conduct a rescue. So it's quite a serious problem. I hope that's not for real. Is it? Okay. All right. Exactly. Well, I can hear it. Now, you might say to yourself, why is this happening the way it is? The assumption in all the planning for these buildings, because of that one hour fire resistance, around the compartment of the flat would there would be no mass evacuation that's how these fires are for 20 floors still floors up that's you're not going to start evacuating everyone um, however there was also and you've got to bear this in mind for the firefighters there was a serious worry a very serious worry that the building might collapse you see that structure the way it was burning you remember 9-11 that sort of message was very strong in firefighters' minds, but they still went, they still climbed. And in fact, they penetrated every floor. So there's no uh, loss of bravery or courage. They did everything they should. And in fact, this fire, um, the last rescue was carried out at eight o'clock in the morning. So seven hours after it had begun. They managed to rescue about 65 people, bringing them down the stairs. Uh, and some of them, some of them in pretty horrible condition, but they got them out. They've carried out their own internal reviews, uh, the London Fire Brigade, and for example, they've now increased their predetermined attendance. For these sort of calls, it will be four pumps and an aerial. If they get multiple calls, more than four people ringing in from the same block of flats, they will send eight pumps and senior officers and all the command unit that goes with the larger attendance. They, they're issuing smoke hoods. They've issued smoke hoods so that when fire crews find someone who needs rescuing, they can at least put them under some cover to get them through the door. They're looking at drones and the use of drones uh, as part of the process. They've increased their training in control rooms, in procedures, in, uh, for officers leading tower block fires. They've done all the things, I think, that you would expect a modern service to try and do to learn the lessons. And I think if you're really interested, you should go onto the London website and London Fire Brigade website and you should read their, their interim reports on what they've tried to do get, to get this right. They've also gone for four 42 metre ladders, high reach uh, uh, aerial ladders, because they, they believe that if the aerial ladder had been in attendance on the first attendance, it might have just, just stopped that fire spreading out of the building up the cladding system. So it's another tactic that they're looking at. Um, one of the biggest issues is the single staircase. This is a single staircase building, this is it. Can you imagine what I've told you? Up to 100 firefighters in that building trying to go up and bringing people down. And that's one of the reasons mass evacuation would never normally be considered in these sort of high rise buildings. It's one of the concerns, but it continues to be a point of serious debate. There is also no central alarm in these buildings. In UK, we don't need a central alarm. We don't have that. But the alarm for residents, I mean, so the, the people in the building wouldn't have an alarm. 
They have individual smoke alarms in their apartments. But the central alarm goes to a receiving centre and the receiving centre then informs the fire brigade. Again, built around that principle that the people were going to stay put. They were going to stay in the building. Um, that's now changed. And in most of these buildings now, temporary alarm systems have been fixed. Um, the process, as they say, also involved ventilation. The, the ventilation system was designed to keep the smoke off one floor to allow the firefighting and rescues to be conducted. The ventilation system on the time of the fire was not working. It had been reported with the fault, it wasn't changed. So you can see the fire and rescue effort uh, was, was quite uh, difficult to undertake. The process of, of uh, protecting these buildings in the UK predates legislation where our higher buildings, 30 metres and above, have sprinklers. This building did not have sprinklers and would not be required to have sprinklers and buildings of this kind would not be required to have sprinklers. However, the government uh, is now consulting on fitting sprinklers and it's looking for a lower height. It's looking perhaps at 18 metres as the threshold height. They're doing that in Scotland, which is obviously part of the United Kingdom and the UK government is looking at it, doing it as a whole. The big issue in most of, uh, of the early narrative phase one investigations has been this stay put policy. Um, the one hour protection was designed so that you didn't have simultaneous evacuation. You didn't try to empty all floors. That policy in this building changed at 47 minutes past two when the ground commander looked at the building and said, forget it, everyone's got to come out, whether they're coming down the stairs, they're coming out. And the control room, which had been talking to residents who were trapped, you think of the control room staff, talking to residents saying, no, stay where you are, and these residents are crying and pleading. The control room staff were then told, tell them to get out. Just tell them to leave, we're trying to get them down and the policy changed. But every person from the first attendance, the watch officer, the station commander, these are the sort of more junior ranks till the assistant commissioner gets there, all those people said they did not think it was feasible to evacuate the whole building. Although there was a, a short window when about 110 people came out before half past one. A lot of people did actually evacu self-evacuate at that time but they thought it would be chaotic with the firefighters trying to get in and the public trying to get out. So, there's a lot of um, pol politics around this, as you would imagine. There's this area, I should explain, uh, in North, North London, Kensington, Chelsea, is one of the richest boroughs, areas of the city in the United Kingdom. Multi-millionaires, people like that live there. This was a social housing block. So a massive separation between wealth and deprived, and that's created a big emotional, uh, political argument. And groups have been set up, some predated the fire, like the, uh, the, the Grenville Action Group, which had been complaining, I've got to say, to the owners of the building, the council, that it had got massive failures long before the fire, and arguing that they weren't doing anything about it. And post-event, there's groups like Justice for Grenville, um, Grenville United, which are driving very hard to make sure that nothing is buried, literally in this, and it's all out there in the open, and people are properly looked after. Uh, the public outcry was enormous in Britain. It's very difficult to describe this, um, but, it, but I mean, the, the amount, there's millions of pounds donated, thousands of goods uh, taken out there, Health-wise, they reckon about 67% of the people involved around this fire have suffered mental health problems, post-traumatic stress, and that includes firefighters. And in fact, the commissioner of the London Fire Brigade says she's, she's already had uh, help herself. So there's a big issue around mental health still, 
There's lots of people uh, still needing rehousing. They've been offered, but all sorts of problems of trying to get it right. There's wide speculation on the economic costs. Um, the building, I think, was 20 million, but there's talk that it could be a billion, the cost of this, by the time you do litigation, compensation, rehousing, um, demolition, replacements of goods. So a great, great problem. Now, that's the background of it. Um, so what's been happening in the national scene? Well, a couple of really big uh, programs. The government instituted and set up that public inquiry. Very soon after it started that, it started looking at the building program, how the building control system had allowed this to happen. And it also started looking at the competency of everyone involved in the process, and that includes you, the firefighter. Everyone. From the, the woman who put, put the fire alarm in, to the, the guys who put the fire doors in, to the building man who agreed that that cladding system could be put on that building, to the risk assessor who described that everything was, you know, everybody's competency has been challenged. And one of the outcomes of that is the entire industry. Uh, the National Committee in the UK for CTIF is called the Fire Sector Federation and many of our Federation members are actually within the trades. There's a lot of fire brigade people but there's a lot of people in alarms and all those sorts of businesses as well. And we've all become involved in this document that you see behind which is a report about competency. And if you're interested, it's on the internet, if you're interested it makes a, a fascinating read of how little competency is measured and described and controlled and influenced and used. And what you find is you've got people who make investments driving the system but not employing people who maybe put time, energy, effort, money into making sure their people are of the highest quality. So what you end is a, you can end up with a distorted marketplace where the lowest cost actually wins the contract not necessarily the people who put all the money into learning and so on and so forth. And this report makes a, a, a good read. They also, as part of the process, set off a review of our building system. And this report, the blue collar there, uh, reports upon that. This basically looked at the control system, and I know you can't see the picture, but or you can't follow the picture, and that's the point. That was the system under which Grenville was built. And you can see just by glancing at it that it's very complex. And the argument of that is, of course, you can have gaming of the system. So if somebody can't get a result this way, a yes, they go over there and maybe they can get a yes over there. And they, they game uh, the system. And it's complex. Even if you're trying to do it properly, it's difficult, you know. So they reviewed the entire building system. We've done this, and they've just published a review, and that's the new system. 